Well, he's an Atlanta native. They live up in northeast Georgia. He attended the United States Naval Academy. He's got so many things that I'm giving you the abbreviated version. Uh, was deployed aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt after his training. He flew 34 combat missions in Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He joined the Blue Angels in 2007, one of the most elite uh, flying groups that you will ever see. He served as the narrator and VIP pilot in 2008. He also solo pilot and uh, NATOPS officer in 2009. He's an American hero. He wouldn't say that. He's very humble, very kind. But would you give a warm welcome to Top Gun Commander Frank Wiser. I don't know if you can see Bill on the keyboard, but he's got his aviator glasses on. And I mean, they're, t you know, they've never played that when I come out to preach. I don't understand what the deal is here. I'm a Top Gun preacher. Come on now. <laughs> Try to be. Try to be sometimes. Thanks again for being here. We really enjoyed talking in the first service. I saw, Sharice and I went to see the movie uh, Maverick. The numbers are already in. It's the number one movie on the planet, in the world. It's breaking every record. It's got a great message, a message of inspiration and hope. Um, what was that like working with Tom Cruise behind you and you're flying feet off the ground and doing those amazing feats in that aircraft. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an incredible experience, of course. And one of the things it did for me was it broke down a lot of my Hollywood stereotypes because um, I went into it thinking that these people were going to be either um, you know, too good to deal with just me or having an air of um, superiority about everything. But what I found was to, the, to a person, they were incredible. And it wasn't just Tom and the other actors. It was really, it takes such a machine to, to do what they do. And uh, they were all just really incredible folks, and the experience was tremendous. It was nice to see behind the curtains a little bit and know what they do. Um, and Tom was a real treat to fly with. He is a, a hardworking guy, like I mentioned before, and he just, um, you don't get to that level of success without working hard. And so he, the, the man knows how to work, and he is always at it, but he's also an experienced pilot, which makes it a lot more fun to fly with him because he was just really strong in the airplane. And what I found was when he didn't have any limitations, we had no limitations as a crew. So we were only limited by what the jet would, could do, which is a lot, actually. So it was, it was a really, from my vantage point, it's just wanting to go up and fly safe and have fun. We, we really had a good time. It's just fascinating to me, and I'm sure to every person out there, you know, flying a machine like that, uh, how, how, fast, how fast do they get up to? I think there's a line that says, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> uh, the, the speed that's published for that airplane is 1.8 Mach. So that's 180% uh, the speed of sound, which is about 750 miles an hour. So it will go really fast. And, and those G-forces, um, have you ever passed out? Not in an airplane, but we get into a simulator that spins you around and around until you pass out. And it is an uncomfortable feeling, for sure. And even being at seven or eight Gs, is really hard on your body. You feel like there's an elephant in your lap. You know, your body's pulled into the seat. If you go onto a roller coaster at Six Flags, you might feel maybe two Gs at the bottom of the loop. But this is, you know, I'm a 200 pound person, so I'm, I weigh 1,600 pounds. It's a lot. And, and you've got to keep your, you've got to keep your wits about That's you. That's the truth, yeah, flying, it's not right? just surviving. It's actually thinking and still piloting the airplane. You're, you're a different breed. I mean, you're different, why, what? What would you, I mean, not only doing that, just, just flying, but then going into combat situations like you've done over and over in Iraq and other places and knowing that you're going to be fired at, knowing that you, the enemy would love as a trophy to take you and your plane down. Uh, do you, do you, do you, you guys seem like a do you deal with that fear? Is it real to you or is it just a kind of something kick in? Yeah, I think um, obviously as a pilot, you, are, you have to be prepared. So you, you study and you prepare and you train properly to avoid that. 
But um, as we discussed earlier, for me, fear is not, was never an issue. And, and that's because we're Christian. And I'm a Christian, so I don't, I'm not afraid of dying. That's the ultimate, the best is still yet to come for us, right? What I fear is not the airplane. What I fear is losing the people close to me. I would be fearful of not being there for my family as they grow up. But um, fearful of flying over bad guy country was never something that bothered me. I, I was amazed to learn uh, in the first service that you don't really have, you didn't really have um, even any experience in flying until you got in the Navy. And what happened? Yeah, that's right. I went to the Naval Academy. Um, how, how old were you? Well, I went to the Naval Academy at 18, so right out of high school. But I went there to serve my country. And so for me, it's all about service. It's not about what I did. It was about the fact that I did something and that I, I wanted to serve. And, and however I could serve our country, uh, I'd let them decide that for me. And they do that anyway. They, the military is very much, uh, they, the term is needs of the Navy. And so my skill set was best aligned with flying. And so that's what I was assigned to do. And then I learned that way. But what I found out right away on flight number one was I loved it. It was just an incredible experience. And then it becomes this incredible blessing because I can now serve my country and do something I enjoy doing. Absolutely. Were you, do you feel like, I mean, it's just, it almost sounds so random, you know, if you wouldn't have went into the military, you, you would have never maybe flown an airplane. Know, it's insane. Yeah. And, and yet that gift was in, you're not just a pilot, which is incredible, but you are a, a top pilot. I mean, the, you were the one that the Navy sent to do these to represent in this amazing movie. And I guess, you know, I, it just blows my mind that that gift was in you and somebody identified it and somebody, uh, you know, saw that in you. And then one thing leads to another and you excel. It's funny that when I went to the Naval Academy, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And that was before SEALs were popular after 9-11 and that sort of thing. This was in the mid-90s. And so I was really heartbroken, actually. I cried when I found out that I was going to fly. And now there's one other aspect of this, which is if you go to flight school, you don't know what you're going to fly. And you can fly the fighters or you could also fly cargo ships or helicopters or maritime patrols. So there's a lot of ambiguity in what you end up doing. But I was heartbroken about it. And when I went down to flight school, I was surrounded by people who really had wanted to do that since they were little itty-bitty kids. And so my mind at the time was, I'm just going to work, I'll outwork all of them, even though it's what they wanted to do, because it's more important that I'm serving my country. And if I'm serving it by learning, if I'm serving by doing something, I can prove more to me by working hard at something I didn't want to do than by just working hard at something I, I had for sure always wanted to do. Yes. Tremendous. Do you believe that, um, do you believe that, that everybody has something in them like that, that God put them here to do. I, I think it would be safe to say you were born to fly. <laughs> you were born to fly. I mean, you, it, the gift is, was in you, is in you. And do you believe God put something in all of us? It may not be a pilot, but there, there's something that God has in mind with every life. I do believe that. Yeah, I think um, you have to ask God, though. You have to be willing to say, Open up your heart and say, you know, lead me the way you want to go and I will follow. You, you sound so matter of fact about, you know, you started flying and you become the top <laughs> pilot. But, but was, there a, um, was there a moment when you recognized that, that there was a talent and a gift that was unusual? It hadn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... I I struggled when I learned. Uh, I felt like I was a really below average pilot for a while. But once again, it's if you keep at it and you keep trying. Uh, and for me, when I get to my lowest point, I resort to prayer. Because what else is there? You, when you, um, when you, you know you can't do it all on your own, but there is someone who can help. And so that's what I would always fall back on. And I believe that my success is because of my relationship with the Lord. Amen. So good. Amazing. Growing up in Georgia and, and then being out making a major, maybe the biggest movie in, in so far in history uh, as far as people seeing it and bringing hope and inspiration through that. Did you ever dream that you could have the kind of impact your life has had not only on freedom and defending our freedom, the feeling that my wife and I had when we watched and left the movie was one of tremendous gratitude 
to the armed forces um, because we realized while we were eating popcorn and having a good time, there were men and women who absolutely put their lives on the line. They're in danger even as we speak in this room right now, and they do it day in and day out all the time watching. Yeah, I don't think I anticipated um, having an impact like we've been able to have for a variety of reasons. One of the unique things about being on the Blue Angels for so long is that you go all over the country and you get to share this dream of aviation. You share why I was called to serve um, and you have a chance to hopefully inspire and motivate you know, the future generation. And for me, it was never about serving in the Navy. I wasn't trying to find a bunch of fighter pilots or find sailors to fix airplanes. It was just explaining why I felt called to serve and for me, it's the military is the way in which I chose to serve, but there's so many ways to serve and everyone here is serving. And so it was a chance to inspire and to just tell kids that it's better to give than to receive and it's better to serve than to be served. And in this world, you're, you're constantly, it's most important to do a little bit of everything and to, um, to give that back. The Blue Angels have this really cool capability of sharing this incredible thing, this air show. Uh, the gentleman that I named my son Ben for was the best guy I've ever met in my whole life. And he died in an airplane crash. And it was heartbreaking for me and for our family. Um, but he had joined the Navy to fly because of seeing the Blue Angels perform. And he made me such a better person just by being, just, just the kind of person he was that I spent my time on the Blue Angels trying to find one more of him. If I can go out and motivate and inspire these kids and find one Ben who can kind of change the world, then mission accomplished on my end. It's so good. I think, um, so, so you're flying in at night over the ocean and you've got a short runway that you've got to land that thing. And let's just throw in for kicks, stormy weather, bad weather, cause you have to do what you have to do. What is that like? What is that like landing that fighter jet on that runway? What would you describe it as? Um, Doing, landing on aircraft carrier in the daytime is fun. Once you get good at it, it's one of the most unique and enjoyable things in all of aviation. But doing it at night is not that way. Doing it at night is just work. And it's, it is scary. And you, it's scary only because you know your limitations as the pilot and you know your aircraft's limitations and you know the things that you can't control, which is what the aircraft carrier does, what's what the weather does. And, um, and there's just so many ways to have things go wrong or to mess up. And so it's actually liberating the sense that you realize you can't do it all yourself and you have to trust. And you know, first and foremost, you trust the Lord to keep, to keep you safe, but you also trust the people around you that, as we were talking earlier, the time on the Blue Angels, the time behind the aircraft here at night, it's a level of high trust where you're putting your life in so many people's hands at the same time. And any of them with a simple mistake, not a deliberate mistake, but a simple mistake could cause you to perish on that evening. And so you have this level of trust that you put in everyone around you, the person steering the ship, the person talking you down, the person that's responsible that the lights work, the person that had fixed my airplane before I went flying, my wingman who's with me. You know, there are times where, um, for example, one night over the North Arabian Sea, everything in my airplane just went dark. Everything, a total electrical failure. And so another airplane joins up and the only way to land is to follow that airplane into land. Now they're not gonna land. They, they fly just about close enough that you can fly on their wing at night and they drop you off and you look forward and then you land. So talk about a level of trust that this wingman of mine, I, I know I can't do it alone anymore. I don't have the capabilities. I don't have the avox to do it. So it's, it's a high degree of trust, but it, it's actually a really wonderful thing to be able to, to trust another human being that much. And, and when you're on that, uh, that ship and you know that that night you're going out on a mission, you did many, 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 34 combat missions, but hundreds of situations you were flown into during the Iraq war and so on. When you're laying on that bunk in that, in that ship, and I know you're missing your family. What, what do you think about? How do you prepare mentally for knowing I'm not only going responsible for this machine, and run my mission, but I'm going to be fired at. I'm going to be in danger. I could never see my family again. What was that like, and how did you get through that? Prayer. What's the, what's the prep? What, what it, is it a normal day, or is it a routine that you go through? And 
Yeah, if, um, for us, especially if we fly a lot at night and that's because we're good at it. And uh, so you have in the military, there's, an, there's a tactical advantage by operating when other people can't operate. And so the US military is really good at operating in the darkness. Uh, and we do it with night vision goggles. We, uh, we train more, we get more experience and, and more uh, hands-on training. And so we do that because it gives us an advantage. And so if you're flying at night, you're not even taking off till nine or 10. So you try to sleep in as late as you can. But um, when you wake up and you know you're flying at night, you're thinking about it all day long, for sure, because you understand the risks. And, and more importantly, you've had friends who have perished doing that exact same thing. So we try to honor them by learning from their mistakes and by not making the same mistake twice, but um, yeah, you have to be you have to be mentally strong and prepared before you ever launch, because you're strapping a thirty-five thousand pound or forty-five thousand once you load all the ordnance on plane onto your back. How did your faith uh, hold you steady through those trying times, and and even in what you do? How how does your faith? What role does it play? I'd say it's all consuming on my end. It's uh, and it has to be. Um, when you realize that you can't control it, but only the Lord can, and, and you put your faith in Jesus, it's actually a, a pretty big uh, blessing to know that, um, like I said, uh, you're not fearful. You're just um, you're grateful. That's the word I spoke of earlier. It's, um, I, I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here, of course, but I was very grateful to be able to serve. It, it is, um, it's quite a blessing to actually serve a cause bigger than yourself, and that's really what it comes down to. It's um, a chance to do something that you can take pride in, but also that you know you're doing something valuable for the world around you is, is a blessing. You, you talk about trust. I was just thinking about it and, and how you have to trust your wing man and your people and your friends, but your wife and your family, we just don't always understand that. I think the price that the family pays. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I, I made the choice to serve my country. Um, when we were dating, my, I said to my wife, you know, we're, if this becomes more, if we get serious, uh, almost trying to warn her off that this is not an easy life to be a Navy wife because I'll be gone a lot and you're going to be home by yourself and hopefully raising a family. And, and she told me at the time that she felt that was the way she was called to serve and that it takes the spouse too. Power, power, power. Yeah. And on that, so she chose to serve on, at my side, but the children, they don't make that call. They're born into that level of service. And so my oldest daughter was born, I was with her for one day as we moved between Virginia and Florida. And then my son was born when I was at a, on a four week swing doing air shows with the Blue Angels. And our, our baby girl was born uh, while I was over Afghanistan. And it, 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 I mean, it's hardest on Bethany, but it's of course really hard to be gone so far away. You know, I, I got in my airplane the day that Caroline was born and I typed in the waypoint. So in, in airplanes, you, it's where you're going, your route. And as I took off from the carrier, I typed in the waypoint for the hospital she was born at to see the, the most direct route if I had to get to her. It was like 8,950 miles over the North Pole and back down to California. I thought, well, I'm a long way, I'm a long way from, from her right then. Wow. That's very touching. It's very powerful. And it's not an easy job being a father. It, it's fun and, and, and easier when they're young, but at some point, kids become, um, you know, independent, and that's, that's the goal. But there's great challenges with that. What, what would you say to uh, fathers out there today? You know, I don't know how people do it without the Lord. I don't know how you raise a family in the 21st century without Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And I may fail at a lot of things as a father, but I will not fail at passing down to my children that cornerstone of everything that you ever dream of, it must be built on Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That's success, right? That's, that's a hero if we can do that as fathers. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that um, it takes a far stronger and more powerful man to admit when they're wrong and to ask for forgiveness. I think um, being brave isn't about just protecting your family all the time. It's about letting your children know that you also are vulnerable and that you can make, make mistakes. We were driving to church this morning and we were having a, my daughter, my oldest had written a kind note that we read last night. And she mentioned, you know, through the ups and the downs and the tough patches. And I said, tell me what those tough patches were. 
And so we went through a time that she was essentially banished to a chair to sit for a period while she thought about what she'd done wrong. And I said, you know, just so you know, it's harder on me than on you. And she laughed at me because I don't think you know, Dad. It's definitely harder being punished. And I said, no, it's, it's harder to punish because you don't know if you're doing it right. And as the parent, you definitely, every parent in the world wants what's best for their kids. They want their children to be better off than they were. They want them to be better people than they were. And so you feel that burden of responsibility, but you, there's no one telling you what to do. And there's, there's no one leading you except the Lord. And so when you invite God into your life, knowing that we don't know all the answers, but we ask him for help, I don't know any other way than that. So good. And today, to all of our fathers, we're here to encourage you. We're here to tell you that I'm sitting on the stage. I know this is so uncomfortable for me to with a hero, but you're just as much of a hero when you stay when you stand, when you say, I love my family, no matter what is going on, they're mine and nothing will ever make me be separate. And that's the kind of heavenly father we have today. How many of you appreciate Commander Frank Weiser coming by with his family? Would you show him some appreciation today? Thank you, sir. You're amazing. Bless you. This program has been sponsored in part by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.